I learned things listening to Jenna. I appreciate what she had to say. Uh, sometimes when you have uh, uh, two preachers in a church, they may believe all the same things exactly on, on, the, on a 35,000 foot level and would s express things slightly differently. And so I don't want things I'm going to say in a second to sound like it's different than what Jenna says because at the, at the super level, we agree. The way we express it is like different facets of the same diamond. And I'm going to take a, uh, an approach at the beginning of, because we're going to talk about uh, federalism and enumerated powers. But you can't divorce any of this from the moral law principles that Jenna was talking about, the divine law principles that, that she was talking about. Uh, I believe the founders um, relied upon three basic interlocking ideas. And it's not one or the other. In fact, if you take any one of these and leave the other two out, it becomes a perversion. And the perversion of a good idea ends up being misuse. And we'll start with um, the, the three principles are self-government, the prote protection of God-ordained liberties, and moral virtue. Now, one way of talking about uh, social contract theory, Rousseau and so on, it sounds a whole lot like self-government, the consent of the governed. And really, in one way, it is effectively the consent of the governed language by skipping out all the other two, eliminating the moral law of God, eliminating the protection of God-ordained liberties from the equation. And so if you just take the consent of the governed as your only principle, then you end up with perversion. And that's what we're talking about. A godless form of self-government ends up in a dangerous place. Just like you can have a tyrannical kind of government in the name of God, where you try to impose uh, law on people, ignoring the consent of the governed. And when we were burning people at the stake in England, in Henry VIII's day, and so on, it was in the name of the moral law of God, but it was a perversion of self-government. It was a perversion of many other things. And so I believe in self-government. In fact, you saw in the Declaration of Independence a moral claim that self-government itself is ordained by God. You'll, you'll see the um, writers of, uh, you know, many writers of a variety of sources uh, talking about the importance of self-government, but the ultimate answer of why self-government is the, the theory we follow, rather than a divine, uh, or rather than a dictator or anything else. By the way, there's no such thing as a benevolent dictator, ever. It's not possible. Why? Because every man is a sinner. There, you cannot have a benevolent dictator. In fact, that truth is the reason behind separation of powers and federalism, which is our exact topic. And so it's not one or the other. Self-government is important. The consent of the governed is important. So is protection of God-ordained liberties. I was in the Soviet Union in 1988 as a part of a group uh, doing um, kind of private uh, human rights international work. Uh, we had actually, my, my own congressman at the time, Frank Wolf, was uh, leading our delegation. We had a member of parliament from Great Britain. I was the international vice president of Christian Solidarity International, international at the time, and we were there to talk to the Soviet officials about things. And I was uh, dispatched by myself to go meet with a group of lawyers who were rewriting the Soviet Constitution. And I made a pitch for them to as they're rewriting, they had a religious uh, liberty provision in their constitution, but it was meaningless. It was a form of religious liberty statement denying the truth of it. And I asked for a particular change to the religious liberty law in, in allowing kids to come to church and allowing parents to create uh, religious schools and homeschools. And they, they asked me, what are the international law documents that guarantee such rights. Now, I now have an LLM in public international law from the University of London. I could answer that question today, but I couldn't have answered it then. What I said to them was actually the higher law. The higher law was, we don't need international treaties to say so, because that is the way God made people. 
And, and they said, you have to remember that we're atheists, <laughs> which is true. They were atheists, and they were, they were making government according to their premises. But it doesn't make it right. And so the ultimate standard is when you appeal to moral standards as the ultimate test or as the filter by which you have to, if you're, you've got two competing uh, interpretations of the word marriage before you're in the court. One leaves God and his morality out, and one includes, one leaves self-government out. And you notice, by the way, in the marriage example, self-government and morality went hand in hand in that particular case. Because 32 states, the people of 32 states had voted because they were driven by their consciences, of, uh, they, they got from God to vote to preserve traditional marriage. And when the Supreme Court ruled in Obergefell that they were going to impose same-sex marriage on all of us, they were violating all three elements of good government. They were violating self-government, they were violating the God-given rights of men, and they were violating the third, which is moral virtue, or godly virtue. All three elements of good government were violated by that, that decision. And, you know, just to tell you an example of how the elitists really work. I went to Gonzaga Law School in Spokane, Washington, which is one of the top three law schools in Washington State. There are three law schools in Washington State. But in one category, it's the number one law school in America. And that is law schools located on the north bank of the Spokane River. In, in that category, it's number one. Uh, but when I was there, uh, they hired Paul Freund, who was a Harvard Law School professor, to come teach a semester of constitutional law. And I had a lot of uh, constitutional law in undergraduate school from an originalist, and I knew a whole lot. And Paul Freund is not an originalist. Um, he was, you know, a very much elitist, judicial activist kind of law professor. But I got the best grade in his class, and he kind of liked me. And he, I did, you know, didn't tell him everything I knew. I was, you know, I was his student. I was learning what I could, but I wasn't changing my, my core principles. I was in his uh, office one day visiting, and he said, Mike, it's too bad we make so many decisions in this country by counting heads rather than by weighing heads which means the elitist should rule over the rest of us. And it was a kind of a soft invitation for me to join the intellectual elites and be a part of the group that imposes our will in violation of the principle of the consent of the governed, in violate, which is a godly moral principle, in violation of the moral law of God and so on. These things work together. And so I believe in self-government. I believe in God as the author of our liberties. By the way, inalienable is a legal term. As Jenna pointed out, a lot of these are legal terms. It means nobody can take it from you. It can't be alienated. It can't be taken from from you, you can't give it away, you can't separate it, you can't sell it. Nobody, not even yourself, can take these rights away from you. That's what inalienable means. And the only reason it's inalienable is God gave it to you. And so I believe all these three things. Keep them together. They don't get separated. When you have them together in balance, government is good. When you strip out and only follow the consent of the governed theory, it becomes perverted. All right, enumerated powers in federalism apply a particular Christian concept. Man is sinful. That's it. That's the concept that gave us enumerated powers and federalism, separation of powers, federalism. All forms of limited government are based on the principle that man is sinful. And you can't trust anybody in government, to, and you need checks and balances. Even if I was appointed the President of the United States, by, you know, voted in as President of the United States by the people, and I think I'd be a pretty you know, good guy and I'd want to do the right thing, I would need checks and balances just like anybody else. Some need them a little more than others, perhaps, but, but all of us are sinful. And nobody should be trusted with absolute power ever. And that's why we gave people enumerated powers. We're going to give you this much power and no more. We're going to divide power up. We're going to give national defense. That goes to the, to the national government. Education, that goes to the state government. Highways, that goes to the state government. 
and you know, so on. You can go down, and the, and the founders intended a, a, a principle that I call uh, exclusive jurisdiction. One level and only one level of government should deal with each issue, not multiple levels of government dealing with every issue. One time I was doing a homeschool case, and I walked from the uh, State Department of Education offices down to the federal courthouse, which is about a oh, mile, maybe, that I walked. And in the space of that mile, I walked past five government offices, all of which had a Department of Education. You don't get five times the services from that. You get five times the bureaucracy, and you make it inefficient, and you, you make things very, very difficult with that kind of an approach. Limited government is essential to the protections of freedom. The founders believe that because why? When government gets too much power, it does evil things. That's the fundamental reason that they did that. The um, um, opposite view is that the nature of man is perfectible. That's the basis of the French Revolution. The basis of the American Revolution, which is actually not a revolution in an ordinary sense because we were not throwing off the existing law. The British Parliament was throwing off the existing law. The law, the British Constitution has never been written. It's the accumulated acts and practices over time. The Virginia law of 1623-1624, approved by the king, was that the colonial government, the colonial House of Burgesses in Virginia had the exclusive power to tax Virginia. And that law was developed and followed without exception for 150 years. And so when the British Parliament asserted the authority to tax the American colonies, it would be like the British Parliament trying to tax Canada today. The Queen of England is the Queen of Canada. She's still the queen, both. It would be like trying to tax Australia today. The British Parliament had no more authority then to tax us than they have the authority to tax Canada. We were fighting because they started shooting at us because we were standing on the British, British Constitution. So revolution, in a sense, is a little bit off. But nonetheless, we stood up for ourselves and said, you will not violate the law of God. You will not violate the, the British Constitution. They went together on that particular occasion, and we stood up for what was right. But the French Revolution had a different idea. They were going to bring in a utopia. And their utopia was premised on the idea that man is perfectible. Man's basically good. And if we just have this wonderful government, then we'll bring in utopia. Let me tell you two things about utopia. First, they're always coercive, which is contrary to the moral law of God that brings us self-government. Secondly, they always fail. Why? Because no man will ever create a utopia. The only utopia will ever be is when Christ is reigning on the earth. That's it. Because we have to have a benevolent king to do that. And only Jesus is good. There's no one good except God alone, Jesus said. And so that's the understanding that we need to have. Anybody that starts talking a utopian dream to you, run the other way. And if you've got something to throw at them on the way out the door, do it. Uh, it is... So the, the whole idea of utopian schemes is what lies behind the growth of government. Why is the gov Washington, D.C. growing so rapidly? They believe that they can solve the problems of mankind if we just had more government. And that's their motivation. Now, for, for particular congressmen, they believe they can buy votes by putting out more government because there's a debate going on and as... as uh, uh, there's really two potential objectives for government. The purpose of government is either to protect life, liberty, and property, those God-given rights, and to punish evil, or to supply my needs. If you believe that the purpose of government is to protect life, liberty, and property, and to, protect, and, and to punish evil, then you believe in a freedom-based country like the United States was founded to be. If you believe the purpose of government is to supply my needs, you believe in socialism. Freedom and socialism cannot mutually coexist for a sustained period of time. There will be a pretense of freedom at the beginning of socialism. It will ultimately involve all forms of coercive socialism. It involves the utopian schemes that man is perfectible and we're just going to get this done. It will not 
last. The more we pursue socialism in this country, the less freedom we have. It is no accident that, that bakers and photographers and florists are being bullied and put out of business because they want to stand up for their religious freedom, for their ability to stand up and say what's right. It's because socialism and freedom are not mutually compatible. We are seeing a loss of our freedom in many, many ways, and not just those, but many, many ways. There are five particular areas that we're going to talk about in the destruction of freedom. I've laid the moral foundation, the philosophical foundation of the problem. Now let's get into the details. And it's not, this is not complicated stuff because the founder, you know, although the founders were heavily weighted by Jenna and my profession, it was also intended that the average person would be able to read and understand and follow it. So it's not supposed to be complicated. Our job, in fact, I'm good friends with Tim LaHaye. Tim told me he wrote every book he ever wrote to a guy in his church named Frank who was a truck driver in a 10th grade education. He said, good writing is taking a really complex idea and explaining it to Frank. And so that's what we're trying to do. What, what the founders wanted to do, they took complex ideas. They took important uh, philosophy and law and freedom ideas and blend them all together but they wanted everybody to understand it. It's not that complicated. It's not supposed to be unattainable or unreachable by all of us here today, including the kids. So five particular areas of problem in the areas of federalism and enumerated powers. I'll, I'll list them first and then we'll go through them one by one. The General Welfare Clause, the Commerce Clause, Executive Legislation, the Domestic Application of International Law, and the Supreme Court is a super legislature. So let's go through those five things. Now, as we go through each one, I'm going to, in the interest of time, hopefully, get all four of these for each of these items. One is, what's the original meaning of the General Welfare Clause? What's the original meaning of the role of the courts? What's the original meaning of the role of the president? What is currently going on in those spheres? And then, what are the implications for federalism in each of these spheres? And then finally, uh, how do these spheres line up with the consent of the governed uh, in each of these, these areas? So we're going to go through them one by one. Let's start with the General Welfare Clause. If you want to know the original meaning of the General Welfare Clause, the first thing that would help you to know is we took it out of the Articles of Confederation. If you know anything at all about the Articles of Confederation, you know this. It was a very weak federal government. Very weak. Congress had zero implied powers. None. And so the idea that a clause we took out of the Articles of Confederation, which was written, uh, accepted in 1781, had a different meaning six years later in 1787 is preposterous. It did not change its meaning in the intervening six years. And so what did it mean? What did the General Welfare Clause mean? And in, this is a point where Hamilton and Madison actually had a disagreement. They agreed on the first part, and then they had a disagreement about the second part. The first part is when the government acts for the general welfare, it means it's for the good of everybody. No private deals for your buddies. No special deals for your locality. So, you know, earmark projects that are local based that Congress used to buy votes. All of that, 100% of earmarks violate the principle of general welfare. All of them. Because they're local projects designed to buy votes. They're not for the general welfare of the country at large. Now, you could have a program that was for the general welfare country, but like an Air Force base. That's for the general welfare of the country but it might be located in a particular community and benefit that community, but the purpose of it isn't to benefit the community. The purpose of it is to defend the nation. And so it is for the general welfare in that sense. So uh, they didn't want insider deals and they didn't want lo local promotion. That's the limiting principle of the general welfare clause. That's what James Madison believed was the totality of its meaning. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, thought it had a second meaning, that it was a grant of power to tax and spend for the general welfare, limited by this principle, limited by the first resolution at the Constitutional Convention, which is we are adopting a government where the states as individual uh, entities 
are jurisdictionally incompetent. Translating it means they don't have the power to act in this zone. So translating it even further, it means Hamilton's view is if the states can spend money on it, the federal government can't. The only three things, or actually really just two, two categories of things in all of American history that I can think of where Madison and Hamilton would actually disagree are the space program and the Louisiana Purchase. Now the Louisiana Purchase could also be the Gadsden Purchase, the Liaska Purchase, other purchases of land, because there's not a specific enumerated power to purchase land from Louisiana. There's not a specific enumerated power to do the space program. But there's a very good argument that, that is, those things are for the general welfare of the United States, and the states are collectively, jurisdictionally incompetent to do either of those things. That's it. But the national debt is not being laid upon us because of the, the Louisiana Purchase or the space program. The national debt is being put upon us because of a whole category of enti so-called entitlement spending that is within the jurisdictional competence of the states. If the states want to have medical programs, the states can do so. If their state constitutions say they can. If the states want to have welfare programs, the states can do so. If their state constitutions say they can. But the federal government, so the states are jurisdictionally competent. They can spend money on education. They can spend money on welfare. They can spend money on insurance and so on if they want to. They're not required to, but they have the legal competence to do so. If the states have the legal competence to do so, the federal government does not. It's really easy. Can the states spend money on education? Yes. Can the federal government spend money on edu education? No. Can the state spend money on welfare? Yes. Can the federal go? No. Really simple. Very easy principle. I'll take either one of the founders on this one. I don't mind the space program. I don't mind. I actually think that Madison's view was the majority view of the, of the founding generation. But I'll take either of them in, in, in this day and age. Either one of them will be just fine by me. So the general welfare clause, here's, not only are we getting a, a national debt, and the national debt, by the way, is not $19 trillion. Counting the national debt as $19 trillion is like saying that when you drive off a, a, a car lot with a $40,000 car and you got a car payment of $800, that the debt you owe is $800. You owe $40,000. You got to look at all of what you're obligated to pay, not what you're obligated to pay next month. The $19 trillion debt is what you we're obligated to pay next month. Immediately current debt. All of the entitlement, Medicare, Medicaid, I'm, six, I, I'm 64 years old and old enough to get Social Security. Wait a second. I said I'm 64 years old, and you're supposed to say, oh, that's not possible. Um, <laughs> but I am, so we'll just go with it. Uh, I'm 64. I'm eligible to get Social Security. I have paid. I've been fully employed every day of my life since I was 14 years old. 50 years of nonstop employment. I've been paying Social Security the whole time. I assume I've paid in, I'm sure it's hundreds of thousands of dollars when you count my employer's contributions alongside of it. Hundreds of thousands of dollars over 50 years. You know how much money they count in the national debt for the amount that I've paid in, they've taken, they've spent it already. How much is there is zero. How much they count in the national debt for what they've taken from me is zero. The real national debt, Tom Coburn and I are working together on the Convention of States project. He says the number is really $19 trillion plus at least another $143 trillion, which is more than all the money that everybody in the United States, every company in the United States, every private entity in the United States owns. You can't tax your way out of this because they'd have to take everything, including all your iPhones. Everything would go. Your clothes, your shoes, everything. We can't tax the billionaires enough to do this. Billionaires being defined as anybody that makes more than $43,000 a year. Um, <laughs> so spending is a problem, but there's another problem in the general welfare clause. It's called mandates on the states. Here's how it works. There's money in Colorado in the people's pockets. The federal government forcibly takes it from the people of Colorado and takes it to Washington, D.C. They mess with it a little while, keep a good chunk of it, and they say, Colorado, 
if you will follow the will of Congress in your education programs like Common Core, we'll give you back some of the money we already took from the people of Colorado. That's how it works. That's called a federal mandate. And the idea that it's federal funds is nonsense. There is no such thing as federal funds. 100% of the money is taxpayer money. Now, the problem is a lot of it is taxpayer money of their future because they're taxing the kids by borrowing the money today that the kids will have to pay back years from now. And so it's, there's a mingling of today's taxpayers and tomorrow's taxpayers in the money they're sending out, but it's 100% taxpayer money. The smarter system, of course, leave the money in Colorado in the first place, and you let the Colorado legislature decide how much we need to take from the people. And if you don't like how much they're taking from you, you vote the rascals out of office. And, and so that's how it's supposed to work. The general welfare clause is the clause that they use to justify this shenanigans. We return to the, the original meaning of the general welfare clause. What happens? Federalism is restored. All state mandates are gone. Not a little. We're not just requiring them to fund them. No, they're all gone. Why are they? There's another principle that, that, that makes them wrong. They violate the consent of the governed. Why is that? The people who vote for Congress were never given the enumerated power. The people never consented to give them education authority. So we've not consented to that. And so they're just acting out of raw power. And so who tells these people in Congress how to vote? The people in their own states. So the people in Illinois, in New York, in Florida, in California, and so on, are telling Congress how to vote. And so the voters in those states are telling the Colorado legislature how they should vote. The Colorado legislature is supposed to be a Republican form of government, which means the people who live under the laws elect the leaders. The people in California don't live under the laws of Colorado. So they have no stake in the laws enacted by Colorado. And when Congress um, tells the state legislature of Colorado what laws they pass, the California voters are getting to tell you what laws you should live under. And the question is, who died and made them king? We, every state, should get to decide for itself. And the general welfare clause is the mechanism that they've used to just absolutely decimate the idea of a Republican form of government. Number two, Commerce Clause. I'm going to teach you the Commerce Clause by using Shakespeare. When Juliet stood on the balcony and said, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? What was she asking? Where is he? Hey, dude, where are you? The answer is, I'm hiding over here in the bush. And if he'd have stood up and said, right here, it would have been a short play, but they would have lived. <laughs> why would she ask the question? Why did Romeo not answer? About three, four years ago, an English professor taught me this. The original meaning of wherefore in Shakespeare's time was not, where are you, dude? It meant, why? What she was asking is, why did I fall in love in Rome with Romeo? Out of all the guys in the city, I fell in love with the enemy of my father. Young men that are here that aren't married, if you ever hear a girl that you're trying to marry ask you the, you know, rhetorically ask the heir the question, why did I fall in love with this guy? Sit down, hide under the bush, and shut up. Listen, he did the right thing, although it didn't end very well, he did the right thing at that moment. Because the original meaning of wherefore completely understand, changes your understanding of that scene. Absolutely changes. The same thing is true with commerce. Commerce in 1787 does, did not mean economic activity. It meant, it's a very technical term, I hope you can follow, shipping stuff. Okay? You got a General Motors factory. Not a blessed thing inside the General Motors factory factory is interstate commerce. Not one thing. I don't care where they got the materials. It doesn't matter. It's not interstate commerce. And nothing that, ha that is inside the General Motors factory is legitimately regulated by com Congress, including the environmental issues from the General Motors factory. Nothing. When they take the car out of the factory and put it in those funny looking trucks, the moment they're loaded on the trucks, 
commerce has started. If that truck is intended to go across the state line, the moment the truck starts driving, interstate commerce starts. When the truck gets to the car dealership in another state, and they take those cars off the truck, commerce, interstate commerce, and commerce itself is over. Banking is not commerce. Mining is not commerce. Agriculture is not commerce. Forestry is not commerce. Manufacturing is not commerce. There is no form of activity other than shipping that is commerce. The federal government, under the Commerce Clause, can re legitimately regulate airline travel and airline shipping. It is the movement of people and products across state lines. Perfectly sensible. The FAA is a legitimate, perfectly constitutional federal agency. But the Department of Labor, the, the Department of Environmental, the EPA, all these others that rely on Commerce Clause authority are not consistent with the original meaning of the Commerce Clause. It means shipping. The rule here is very much like the General Welfare Clause rule. If the, the way you know what commerce is, is commerce was intended to give Congress 100% of the power to regulate interstate commerce. The flip side of that is, if the states can regulate it, then it's not commerce. It's, at least it's not interstate commerce. Banking. What law tells banks that checks have to say pay to the order of? And that the signature is down on the right hand uh, uh, bottom and it's called the drawer and they you know the layout of the check what law says that what law governs the the use of your ATM card where you stick it in some place and how the banks transfer things all over the place is it federal law or is it state law it's state law it's called the uniform commercial code the states said about almost 100 years ago now or it was maybe it's 80 but it's a long time ago they said you know what Banking would really work a lot better if we had uniform rules. And since the states have exclusive jurisdiction over banking and Congress doesn't have jurisdiction over the banking, let's get together and let's write a uniform code and let's all adopt it. And they did. So if we need uniformity on issues delegated to the states, the states have proven they know how to do it. And your ATM cards are proof that it works really, really well. Because if Congress was building the ATM machines, it would be as good as the websites for Obamacare. <laughs> and when you stuck your card in, you might not get any money back, but the federal government would take about half of what you intended to take out. State law works. Banking, you would think if anything is interstate commerce, it's banking. The fact that states regulate banking is proof, absolute 100% proof, that it's not interstate commerce because Congress has 100% exclusive authority over interstate commerce. Executive legislation. The president has a phone and a pen, and if Congress won't act, I will. I get the pen. Is he tweeting laws with his phone? You know, or, or is he getting orders from somebody? George Soros calls up, I want you to write this. Okay, I don't know. But he, that's what he said himself, I have a phone and a pen. The president, the first executive order George Washington issued, he issued executive orders just like Obama. Well, kind of like Obama. Here's what George Washington's order was. Hey guys, you know all you that worked for the, the government under the Articles of Confederation? Please write me a report and tell me what you were doing so I know how to transition. That is a perfectly lawful executive order. Why? It's addressed to government agents and it's asking them to perform a duty. And so, an executive order that deals with the internal operations of government, setting a dress code of the Department of uh, Homeland Defense or whatever. You know, we'll assume that the department is legitimate for the sake of this uh, discussion. But setting dress codes, operation, days and hours for working, you know, duties of government officials, fine and dandy. You could issue executive orders because that's management of federal employees and resources. But when they start talking about, we're going to issue a federal order about your guns, your property, it's not supposed to happen. The most important rule in any government, whether it's the National Football League, the United States, the UN, student government at Patrick Henry College, the most important rule is this. 
who has the power to make the rules? That's it. Now, some people think that the First Amendment is the most important provision of the Constitution because, after all, they put it first. Well, really, they put it third. They proposed 12 amendments to the Bill of Rights, and two didn't get ratified, and they renumbered. So the Third Amendment became the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment became the Second Amendment, and so on. And the operative word here is amendment. It wasn't part of the original Constitution. It was adopted two years later. And so, four years from the time it was proposed, two years after the government was operational. The most important provision of the Constitution is Article I, Section 1. All legislative authority is vested in the Congress of the United States. The only group that can make law is Congress. Why? Because we don't want to give lawmaking power to a small group of people. And we, we don't want to give it to, a peop to people who are not elected by the people. Presidents, though they are elected, do not have lawmaking power. Not one little bit. Not a little bit of lawmaking power, zero for following the original meaning of the Constitution. The same thing is true of the agencies. The Environmental Protection Agency is uh, probably the best example. Um, federal wetlands law, which is predicated on these lands being part of the navigable waters of the United States. At Patrick Henry College, we have a part-time creek. Uh, when it's you know, really, really rainy, there's a creek. Other times, there's no creek. This is part of the federally protected wetlands under the, uh, under the theory that this is part of the navigable waters of the United States. You can't float a Lego boat <laughs> on this creek most of the time. You can never float a canoe. But the test is, can you put an ocean-going vessel on it? Because to be part of the navigable waters of the United States, that's what it has to be able to do, is uh, to accept an ocean-going vessel. So our creek ain't ever going to accept an ocean-going vessel until California and all the western United States falls into the ocean and Purcellville is on the Pacific Ocean all of a sudden. Until then, it ain't going to happen. And so, but in the federal wetlands law, Congress didn't tell us how much land you have to have and how wet it had to be. The Environmental Protection Agency decided that. Congress should make all laws, but the EPA decided it's an acre. Could have been 100 acres, could have been one foot, they made it an acre. How wet did it have to be? When a goose was flying over your property, I'm not making this up, when a goose was flying over your property on the wettest day in 100 years, if it could look down at your property and see its reflection, this is called the glancing goose test. I'm not making this up. Then it's wet enough. Now, if Congress voted that in, here's what would happen. Congressman Smith voted for the glancing goose test. Apparently, he doesn't have the sense that God gave a goose. Yeah. In Obamacare, 2,000 plus times, it says, the secretary shall make rule that. The abortion mandate in Obamacare didn't come from Congress. It wouldn't have passed. It came from the Secretary of Health and Human Services. She made law. That's what Hobby Lobby had to defend against. It was, it was unconstitutional, not because it violated religious freedom. It was unconstitutional because Article I, Section 1 says all legislative authority is vested in the Congress of the United States. And when Congress purportedly delegates its power, it can't do so. Why? Because it's not its power to give away. Because we have the right of self-government. We have the right to elect the people who make the law. They are not giving away their power. They're giving away our right of self-government. They cannot do so. It is utterly improper for them to delegate, supposedly delegate their ability to make law. Unconstitutional entirely. Number four, the domestic application of international law. The reason I have an LLM in public international law is because I wanted to be credentialed and have the background and the knowledge so I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody as I gleefully killed UN treaties, which I have done for at least since 1994. Uh, the, UN, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was coming down us at a screaming path in 1994, and I led the charge, but the HSLDA nationally led the charge, and we killed the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so... <laughs> now, we did the same thing on the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, not because we don't want to have good law for disabled people, 
We just think Americans should make the law for America. We don't need the UN telling us how to make law for disabled people. Besides that, our law on disabilities is so much better than anything that the UN can ever come up with. When a US senator says, I want this treaty, what they're saying is, I'm incompetent to make good laws for Americans with disabilities, so I need the UN to help me and you know, tell me what to do. Any senator that thinks they're incompetent to make American laws for Americans should resign their offices and give it up to somebody who feels up to the task of making American law for American people. It's as simple as that. The Supremacy Clause in Article 7 says there are three things that are supreme law of the land. Number one, the Constitution itself. Number two is laws of Congress in furtherance of the Constitution. Not laws of Congress generally, laws of Congress that actually use the Constitution correctly. Number three, treaties ratified by the U.S. Senate. Okay. Why did they do that? And, they, and it goes on to say anything in any state law or constitution to the contrary notwithstanding. It specifically has treaties overriding state laws. The reason they did that is, is Virginia was messing around with international relations, and Britain wouldn't remove a fort. It was supposed to remove under the Treaty of Versailles uh, on the Ohio River because, because Virginia wouldn't let the Treaty of Versailles, which uh, had a deal about how debts owed to British uh, banks and so on would be handled in American courts, and Virginia took that away and, and, and was one state was making international relations. And so they, treaties dealing with how nations treat nations, they said, no, 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 we don't want states messing around with international relations. They didn't have any idea that someday treaties would be used to say how America governs itself internally. So when the, when the founders said treaties are supreme, it was only another way of saying international relations is exclusively given to the federal government. But domestic relations is not legitimately handled by treaties. And so all of these treaties, all these human rights treaties, are designed for the UN to tell America and every other nation on the face of the earth that also has the God-given right of self-government how they should govern themselves. By the way, international human rights law is ultimately self-conflicted. One of their ultimate principles of human rights law is called a jus cogens principle, a peremptory norm of international law from which there can be no derogation. It means it's always valid, you can't ever change it. It's self-government. So when the UN comes in and tries to tell you what you have to do, they're violating a peremptory norm of international human rights law of self-government. By, I mean, all human rights law beyond that one is conflicted with one of their jus cogens principles. They, you know, they're just totally conflicted. The first article I read for the LLM was a question of why are human rights universal values? And this really goes to what Jenna was talking about earlier. And they went through, this author who was a professor at the University of Leeds, went through every major human rights theory to try to explain why everybody believes that human rights values are universal in character. And, you know, he said, every one of them was wrong because they boil down to this. Human rights are made by man. If they come from man, man can change them, and therefore they're not universal and permanent. He, he got it right. And then he said the only theory of human rights law that is internally consistent is the original theory, which is Christianity. Christianity believes that we have human rights because man is made by God, and that our rights are inalienable because they come from God. He said, however, although it's internally consistent, we all know it's a fairy story, so it can't be true. And so the answer is, human rights are universal, but we don't know why. That's the dilemma of the left. And I was going, yeah, all these people are reading this, and I'm hoping, you know, some of these other students are reading this, and go, whoa, maybe Christianity is the truth, because it's the only one that has an answer for the question of, why was Nazi Germany wrong? Why is genocide wrong? Why is aggression, you know, violent aggression taking over another country wrong? It's because it violates the ultimate moral law of God. That's the only theory that's internally consistent. It's the only theory, therefore, that's true. Internal inconsistency is a sign you're following a lie. The, what we need to do is limit treaties in this country to what they were intended for, how nations treat nations, not how the United States internally governs itself. Finally, the Supreme Court is a super legislature. The Supreme Court should 
always follow the original meaning of the Constitution. Or if they're interpreting a statute, they should follow the original meaning of the statute. And when, there are, when there's two possible cases or interpretations, there's a general rule of law, we should adopt the interpretation that leads to lawful conclusions rather than unlawful conclusions. What they don't do is include the moral law of God as a part of their calculation. And so it's very rare, frankly, that the moral law of God will fi figure in to Supreme Court interpretations on Commerce Clause or lots and lots. Abortion, the, the cases that Jenna covered with you, yes. But the, the legal document that tells them to do so, as Jenna correctly pointed out, is the direct Declaration of Independence. We are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. So you have to adopt a theory of interpretation that correctly follows the foundational statements. And the foundational statements. Now, it's also true if we were in, another, if we were in the Soviet Union, God's moral truth is above the, all that happened and said, you're just morally wrong, it's bankrupt, everything you do is morally illegitimate. It's still lawful, but in our country, we've got both going. The law and the legality match when they, follow, when they are correctly interpreted because our foundations were laid on clear, easy to understand, bed, bedrock Christian worldview moral principles like man is a sinner and we're not going to give anybody too much power. God, our rights come from God. They don't come in often, but when they come in, it is a big, big deal. And when we don't follow the moral premises of our law, we end up with an absolute horrible result in many states, in many cases. But at the Supreme Court, you know, on Obamacare, they said, well, this is not a tax law for the purpose of the Anti-Injunction Act, but it is a tax law for the locus of the authority of Congress to enact it. I hope I've just confused you because the Supreme Court is a, was, was talking out of both sides of their mouth. I call that the Janus explanation. January calendar, you know, Janus had uh, one head, two mouths, you know, you know, that's the Supreme Court. They're talking out of both sides of their mouths. And I wish the Republicans that voted for that decision would resign and run for office. I would send them their first campaign contribution, which would be 30 silver dollars. And um, the, um, the Supreme Court is not supposed to make up the law. Why? Article 1, Section 1 says all legislative authority is vested in the Congress of the United States. Now, we're going to talk this afternoon about amending the Constitution. All authority to amend the Constitution is vested collectively either in Congress and then the states or the states by themselves. There's no equation for the Supreme Court to unilaterally amend the Constitution of the United States. But that's what they're doing on a routine basis. It violates the premise of self-government, which in and of itself is a violation of the moral law of God. Because self-government is a moral principle of God. Um, you know, I know where that's found? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, starting in verse 14. It says, when you pick a king, be sure you pick a king, you the people, self-government, pick a king that God chooses. And then it gives you a whole bunch of criteria for what God chooses. People teach, by the way, that God never wanted Israel to have a king. Not true. That's unbiblical. They picked the wrong king at the wrong time for the wrong reason. But Jesus needed to come from the king. It was not an afterthought. Jesus needed to come from the king. And God wouldn't have put in Deuteronomy 17 how to pick a king if he didn't want to ever pick a king. He wanted to pick a king at the right time for the right reasons under his, his direction. When they picked Saul, they violated everything that's said in Deuteronomy 17. And so, but it's they picked it, self-government. Hosea 8, 1 through 4, it says that judgment was coming on Israel. Why? Because they pick kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. So even though God ordains us to exercise responsibility in this area, he punishes us when we mess up. Sometimes the punishment is the ruler that we've just chosen, as we are experiencing right now. Um, so the Supreme Court needs to get back to being a court and stop being a legislature. Uh, now, I often get introduced, not today, they did it correctly today, uh, I often get introduced as arguing a number of cases in the Supreme Court of the United States, which is true, as long as you remember that one is a number. And, uh, 
and so I've, I've filed lots of briefs in the Supreme Court. I've asked them a lot of times to take my cases. I've argued in lots of state Supreme Courts, but one time in the US Supreme Court. In my case, which is a religious freedom case, whether a young man could take his vocational rehabilitation funds for the blind and go to Bible college, or whether he couldn't. That was the issue. Justice Blackmun, who was the author of Roe versus Wade, said to me, uh, counsel, when have we ever funded religious education before? I'm four years out of law school about arguing this case. I'm fairly confident, but you know, this is the Supreme Court of the United States, and I'm like 32, you know? And so I, I gave him a literal answer. I said, Your Honor, this court doesn't fund anything. It's up to Congress and the state legislatures to fund things. The, the courtroom erupted in laughter. My co-counsel said, all you could see of Justice Stevens was his bow tie going, nga, 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 nga. He, he was laughing so hard. There were three people in the courtroom not laughing. Justice Blackman was not laughing. I was not laughing. My mother was not laughing. <laughs> and then he said, well, counsel, you know what I meant. When have we permitted, under the Establishment Clause, such programs? Well, when he asked me the correct question, I knew the answer. Mueller versus Allen, da, 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 you know, I knew the answer. And so he apparently didn't think I was a smart mouth because he voted for me, and I won the case unanimously. And so the, um, thank you. But, uh, but that's what they think. They think they fund stuff. They think they legal. You, how many of you have heard the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage? Which means they acted as a legislature. In theory, what they did, is the writers and, and ratifiers of the 14th Amendment uh, legalized same-sex marriage, and we just didn't find it for 150 years. All of a sudden, pow, there it is. Oh, there's that provision that we intended back in 1868. Are you crazy? When you say it correctly, the, 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 the truth is the Supreme Court did legalize same-sex marriage, and by saying that, we've said they are tyrants. Because when anybody exercises legislative power other, other than legislators who have been given enumerated authority over the subject matter in question, anybody else who makes a law is a tyrant. When the president makes a law, he's a tyrant. When the EPA makes a law, they are tyrants. When the Supreme Court makes laws, they are tyrants. When, the, when Congress makes a law in an area designated to the states, they are tyrants. If you make law without authority, you are a tyrant. And it's our duty as citizens to deal with this, and we're going to deal with it. Uh, I'll, I'm going to tell you what the solutions to all this are this afternoon. I'm going to make sure you come back, but I also am out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, freedom cannot survive when a government believes that it is the solution to the problems of mankind just can't survive. There are, you know, you can summarize kind of Washington, D.C. under four theories of the various groups that are there. One group believes that man is God. You'd find the ACLU and really hardcore libertarians in that group. I'm, I, I share about 80% of my views with libertarianism, but there's about 20% that I don't. And so, then there are, so that's the man is God crowd. There's the money is God crowd. That it is, you know, George Will, in a case we'll talk about this afternoon, when parents' rights and religious freedom were thrown into the trash heap, said that this is a great decision because it, it, it elevates the main theory of America, and that is the primacy of capitalism over religion. I don't know what history book George Will was reading, but I know that he was valuing his checkbook more than his history book. And unbridled money activity, you think that God, money is God, you pursue one theory of government, and it's dangerous. Then there is the government is God crowd. That's the biggest group. And, and it's government is God because who is gyra? Who provides? When, when it's government gyra rather than, rather than Jehovah gyra, God is thrown off the throne and government is put in his place. So though they won't say, they might even say that they're Christians. They might even say that they're godly, whatever. But if they believe that government is a solution to the problems of mankind, they believe that government is God. And then the fourth group is that God is God. 
and that's a narrow, small group, but mostly that group is asleep. Today we're waking up about 500 people, and I'm really, and plus a whole bunch more watching on the internet, we, we trust and believe. We're waking up, and we're not gonna shut up. We're gonna stand up, and we're gonna speak up, and we're gonna take this country back for freedom for everybody, not just for ourselves. God bless you, thank you so much.